page 12, Fandango. On the previous pages, they're giving you a little bit of theory. I'll just cover it briefly because I'm really not here to teach a theory, but they cover it, so I'll cover it. Oh. On page 8 and page 9, they're talking about the tonic, dominant, and subdominant. They have a whole bunch of fancy words. You're just going to love this, so stick around. Let's go to C major. All the white keys. Well, I already told you before that each key, each note in, in a scale is numbered. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They all have their numbers. We call them steps. Step number. Well, they also have names. Isn't that lo lovely? For instance, the, the C, the bottom, the main note of the scale, whatever it is, in C major it'd be a C, in A major it'd be an A, in D major it would be a D, whatever. That's called the tonic. Tonic. T-O-N-I-C. Tonic. So when they say play the tonic, they're telling you to play the, the first note in the scale. Step one of the scale. Wonderful, huh? Well, the dominant is the fifth step of the scale. One, two, three, four, five. It's, it's one of the primary chords. The one chord, the five, seven, the, the five chord, it's a dominant chord, what we call a dominant chord. It's the fifth chord. It's a, a chord built on the fifth step of the scale here. So the fifth note in a scale, any scale, is called the dominant. Well, the subdominant's easy to remember because it's just one less. So it's the fourth step. And that's it. Those are the they're the primary chords. The tonic, the one chord, the dominant or five chord, and the subdominant or four chord. We'll get to some of the others later. Let's just tackle this for now. And then they give you some ideas. You can go to whatever scale you want and you can figure out and they want you to put in the notes. I've already told you what the notes are. They're lots of fun. Let's move on. On page 10 they cover writing the dominant again. Isn't that wonderful? And then on the circle of fifths. Well, this is where the five comes in. It's the dominant. They give you the circle, and I use the circle. I recommend it when you go through the scales and the arpeggios and whatnot. Follow the circle of fifths. Don't have to. It's just a handy way of going all the way around. When I was in college and I had to do all these scales and arpeggios, we did it by a circle of fifths. Start out with C major, no sharps or flats. And then we add a sharp or we subtract a flat. And you'll find in doing that, every key is the dominant of the previous key, or the fifth of the previous key. Watch, I'll show you. Start out with C. If I go to the dominant of C, I go to G. G has one sharp, so I do G major, G major, the key of G major. When I'm done with G major, I go to its dominant, this is D. D has two sharps. So I do the key of D major, yay! And when I'm done with D major, I go to its fifth, or its dominant, to A. I do A major, three sharps. You see a pattern here? Stick around. Then I do its dominant, E major, four sharps, yay! Then its dominant is a B, I'm going to come down here. Five sharps. Now from B major, I'm going to take its dominant, that's F sharp major. F sharp major has six sharps. Now don't get ahead of me, just follow me for a moment. Then I'm going to take its dominant, the C sharp. C sharp major has seven sharps. That's the most we can have. That's as far as we can go in the sharps. We're done. That's it. There's no eight sharps. There's no point. Well, the, there's an overlap on three of these key signatures with the flats. They share the same notes. So let's just back up. Uh, well, going around the circle of fifths, I want to start at seven flats and go down. Well, let's go back to B major. Five sharps. It's also C flat major. C, C, C flat. Seven flats. So B major and C flat major have the same notes on the piano. 
the scales are fingered the same, the same primary chords. The difference is in one you have five sharps in the written music and the other one you have seven flats in the written music. But they, they're sharing the same notes. That's the and then when I went to its dom the B, I went to F sharp, it's dominant. Well that's also G flat major. They're sharing the same keys, same notes, same fingering, everything is the same. They each have six of their whatever. I have six sharps for F sharp. I have six flats for G flat. Mm -hmm. Then I went from F sharp to C sharp major. And seven sharps. Well, this is also D flat major. It has five flats. I'm subtracting a flat when I do this. Well, I'm out of sharps. I can't go anymore. So now we're in flat territory from from. D flat major or C sharp major, I'm going to take its dominant here and an A flat major. Four flats. Take its dominant here is E flat, three flats. If I take its dominant here, two flats, B flat. And if I take its dominant here, F has one flat. And if I take its dominant here, I'm home again. C major. So it goes all the way around them, seven sharps to seven flats, and it covers them all. And it's just a handy order to approach them. Not the only order available. You can do whatever you want on the order. Some people just add a sharp and then add a flat. And they do one sharp, then one flat, and then two sharps and two flats. And I've always had a problem with that. But this, for some reason, this seems to work for me by adding a sharp and then subtracting a flat. It's kind of fun too. Then you get into the minor minor stuff and as I say I do the key signature. So if I'm doing a C major scale I'm doing the relative minor to that which is the A minor. Have you had minors yet? So I do them both and then when I do the dominant to the C major the, so I get G major one sharp then I'll go ahead and do E minor because that's the relative minor to G major. So the majors are controlling going around but as I do each one I do its relative minor also because that's that's the same key signature and that's the circle of fifths. <laughs> now let's talk about Fandango. In this piece it's kind of fun. A few little things I want to point out. There's nothing real tricky about it. It's just a fun piece to play. Except of course it's fast. But it'll, if you want to go fast this is fun too. Starting with the right hand. Staccato legato. Three, four time. I do a nice light finger staccato. You can do a wrist staccato because the left hand's doing wrist. If you want to do wrist and both, that's fine. Then second line, look here at that ending. The last two measures has an ending. They don't label it first ending, second ending. It's just the line, you know it's an ending. Something's going on here. And if they have a note, right? Before that measure, there's a double bar, there's a note to next string. So what they're doing here is saving them a little money on printing costs by reusing some of the stuff they've already had. Makes it harder to follow, but we can deal with it. So second line on the third to the last measure when you play that, those two quarter rests, after you play those rests, you're going to go to the next line. Next strain means the next line. Go on. And so you... And then you're here. The fingering you use on the third and fourth lines is up to you. They're saying three, five, four, two. We want to connect the top note. That's what we want to hear. That's what we're protecting. So I'm here. I go here. I'm going to hold the top note down and I'll do a two, four on the next one. And then a 1-3, and then a 1-2. If you don't want to put a thumb on a black note, it's not so bad here because the second finger, there's no black note in between here, so you have a little more room. You can twist, you can lean out if you have to to get it. So don't avoid it all the time, but a lot of times you don't need to put a thumb on a black note. Sometimes you do. And then going on. Top of page 13, same thing, just follow their fingering. 
connect the top note. Then you have a repeat sign, sends you back over to the third line on page 12, and there's a note, second time ABA. So the right hand, when you go back, you're going to come up here and play it all up here. Yay team. Then you go back to page 13 and you go on. You get to the second line, you're back down here. Etc. Then the third line you have a repeat sending you back up, but this time you're going to go an 8 VA, second time 8 VA. So the right hand on second time comes up here and play that. Then you get down to the third line after the repeat sign, then you come back down again. Etc. Then you repeat this part, and the second time the right hand goes back up. It's like the right hand don't know where it wants to go, does it? up its mind. And then at the bottom you have a DC Alfine sends you back to the beginning. You're down here. And then you get to the second line on those last two measures. Now, because it's playing at the same, now you can play these. And here. Not fun? Oh boy. Left hand. You got these nice chords. They're primary chords. Just a real staccato. Not heavy. Light. Short. So you get to the third line, and now the contrast. Now, now it's not staccato anymore. It's not. Now it's smooth. I'm just rolling the. I'm just. It's like a, a, a spiked wheels rolling. I'm just rolling here on its side. The wrist and the arm is just doing whatever they're doing. I'm not trying to do anything with them. I, they're they're just following along. Keep the left hand down. They have the dynamics there of MF dice P, so the first time you're going to play it MF here. And that's the melody, that's the top note here. Everything else has to be softer than that. And then when you repeat it, it's going to be soft. And that's the top note, but you're up here, so everything else has to be super soft, whatever that is. It's going to be down on this. That's even going to make it more fun to make it soft. Oh, page 13. When the right hand is going back and forth, up and down an octave, the left hand stays put. There's nothing about the left hand moving. So the left hand is just going to stay in this area. It's not going anywhere. It's going to do its thing happily and softly all the way through it. Until you go back to the top and then it can do this thing happily. It's a high. They have a note at the bottom about the relative minor. I just spoke about relative minors. So this, believe it or not, happens to be in pretty much A minor. No sharps or flats. You think it's C major? No, it's the relative minor. It doesn't sound like it. I mean, it's not. that doesn't exactly sound like A minor, but it is. Take my word for it. It's A minor. So, it just happens to be the dominant of A minor. We've had dominance. You're just starting out sort of with a five chord, sort of. Don't let the accidental throw you, because in a, in a minor, a lot of times, the seventh step of the, of the scale will be raised a half a step. And in A minor, the seventh step is G, so you'd play a G sharp instead. You got G sharps. I want to play this sort of slowly. Now it moves. It's allegro. So, and you can have fun with this. this. is a piece you can play for people. They'll enjoy hearing it. And you just memorize it eventually. It's, there's not a lot going on. There's a lot of repetitious stuff going on. So, yeah, just memorize it. Kind of starts out mysteriously. So. And then you get louder. So you're going to crescendo up to the loud, but you've got to plan that out. Otherwise, you'll be loud too soon. So in the third measure of the first line, you're still soft. And then try, I do it measure at a time when it spans multiple measures. I try and figure out on each measure where it is, or if there's phrases involved, I may do it by phrase. So here, it's like the first line, I might build my way up to sort of a medium soft. By the end of the first line, I'm going And then the second line, uh, the first measure is going to be medium soft again. Now I can go up to a medium loud and then loud. I don't want to be loud until that fourth measure of the second line. So you have to plan these things out to make them effective. They're fun once you get them. 
And you'll impress people with that. They'll think, wow, oh, that's something. They don't realize how much actual planning and work you did to make that happen, but they like what they're hearing. You know, as far as the pedal goes, I want to adjust it just a little bit. They're, they've got a lot of legato pedaling going on. I don't care for it, but I'm going to put up with it. You need practice with legato pedaling, fine. But I would still like to hear a break between the phrases. I like to hear the phrases. They're not real clear here where the phrases are. So I'm going to edit this just a little bit. You can disregard all this if you want and just pedal it like they're saying, but I think I'm going to give you the ideas. And you can take a pencil and mark them in as you need to. On the last line on page 12, they have this going legato pedaling throughout pretty much. You have it at the beginning here. I would like to hear a break in the sound in the right hand between the third and fourth measures. After the, all those tied notes in the right hand, I, I want to lift up and come down and I'm going to lift the pedal up with it. So I hear a, a silence in the right hand. The left hand stays legato throughout. There's no silence there. So it's this way. If I were to play it without pedal, say the third and fourth measures there, the last line without pedal, it would be this. There's a little silence in the right hand. Well, I want that same silence even with the pedal. So I'm going to lift the pedal up with the hands. So the second, third, or the third, fourth measures is this with pedal. So the right hand gets silence. At the end of the first line on page 13, same thing. It's ending a phrase. I'm going to lift the pedal up with the hands so we get silence in the right hand. You, the left hand stays down. It stays legato. It's just the right hand. Then even when you go on, whether you repeat or not, it doesn't matter. The pedal is going to be pedaled the same. When you go on, on the second line on page 13, again, at the end of the phrase, in the right hand, I'm going to lift the pedal up with the hand. So on that, what is the fourth measure, one of the B, before I go on, I want a little silence before I do that, and the pedal is going to help me out there. So to do what the second line of page 13 is this, so just a little bit of silence there. Third line, I, I'm, again, I'm going to lift the pedal up with the hand, the right hand, at the repeat signs, because that ends as a phrase. Whether I'm repeating or not doesn't matter. I'm still going to lift the pedal up with the right hand. And then at the bottom, they tell you to lift the pedal up, finally, before you go back to the top. So there's a little silence before you go back to the top. And that's the adjustments I want to make with the pedal. It makes it a little harder, a little more difficult for you, but It'll come in handy later on because I'm going to push it even more and I want to make some other pedal adjustments even more as we go through the book. So I'm going to try this out slowly. And if you want to play along, you go ahead. I'm going to give myself three counts and then here we go. Again, I'm not trying to perform it. I'm going to take it too slow for that. I'm just going to give you an idea of what it sounds like. Then you have to add your own interpretation to it. So interpretation-wise, you can do anything you want as long as you don't violate what the music is telling you to do. You make it yours. But this will give you an idea. One, ready, go.
two, three.